Hello, I'm Glenn Cowan. I'm a professor at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. I'm going to be starting a, a few different videos talking about CMOS receiver design for energy efficient short reach optical links. These slides were recently presented as part of a tutorial at the ISCUS conference, and I've decided to post some short segments of this uh, over the coming weeks. So I hope you enjoy this. This tutorial was put together by myself, uh, my PhD student, Dale Dinabal-Rahman, uh, my collaborator at McGill, Professor Odile liboran Ladouceur, and her PhD student, Baha Radi. The outline of the portion that I will present is shown here. So first we're going to talk a little bit about why we need energy efficient bandwidth in I.O. Then I'll introduce some wireline communication fundamentals, and that's what's going to be the main subject of this video. Subsequent videos will talk about optical communication fundamentals and give an overview of optical receiver design. Then in the, the final section of these videos, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the motivation uh, for designing a receiver that has an intentionally limited bandwidth. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the noise characteristics of those receivers. So this slide shows some of the scaling trends that have happened over the last 20 or so years. The um, three figures uh, shown here come from the Through the Looking Glass magazine, uh, Through the Looking Glass article. That's, um, that's an article that's published every year um, in the Solid State Circuits magazine talking about trends, uh, technology trends that will be highlighted at the given year's ISSEC conference. So on the, the top left, we have the classic Moore's Law that shows the transistor count uh, going up over time. So that's showing you know, more and more chips, more and more uh, transistors per chip. And then um, we see that, you know, if you can imagine having more and more transistors, those transistors need data. They need data and they're producing data. So it, it drives uh, an IO demand. We also see that those transistors on the, on the right here are being out partitioned into multiple cores per chip. And so that, that's done in order to uh, give parallelism. I guess part of that's happening because CPU clock speeds are, are not really going up anymore. Since the early 2000s, they've sort of been flat. So the way we're going to get more, more computational power from a, a CPU is to, to parallelize computation. So the figure on the bottom left shows a, sort of a stylized view of transistor count going up in red. It's the, the steep curve. And then what we see is that the, the number of IOs per chip is going up much less quickly than the, the transistor count. And so I'm using transistor count as a proxy for thirst for data. So if the number of ports is going up much more slowly, it means that the data rate per lane has to go up almost as fast as the transistor count. The good news is data rates have gone up. So on the bottom right, we see that the data rates of of many standards over the last 20 years. Now, Moore's law and the, you know, the scaling of transistors has gone up where densities are doubling every two years. It's taking about four years for many of these standards to double in data rate. So we do have a bit of a data rate bottleneck. So that's putting constant pressure on IO designers to get as much, uh, get as high a speed as possible. The other issue that, that IO designers are facing um, yeah, uh, the other issue that IO designers are facing is that these microprocessors operate within a power envelope. You can't make a microprocessor dissipate more than about 100 watts. And so we want to have as much of that power as possible to do the actual computation for which we've uh, you know, decided, decided to use this microprocessor. But we can't because we're going to have to use some of that power for IO. So that power envelope puts an ever increasing pressure on IO designers to make their IO as energy efficient as possible. So let's take a look at some of these figures. So we have the, the standards on the top left, then we have the data rate as a function of the process technology node. 
So it's no surprise that as we use a smaller and smaller feature size CMOS technology, an electrical link can operate at higher and higher data rate, going up like that. Um, now, what we'll see in a, in a moment is that electrical links suffer from significant channel loss, meaning that although copper is a great conductor for, for DC signals or 60 hertz, uh, various uh, skin effect phenomena mean that a PCB trace, which might have negligible resistance at DC, provides significant attenuation for high frequency signals. And so we can, we can do things to equalize that, but what we see here um, on the, the bottom right is that the more attenuation, the more loss we have at the Nyquist frequency, which is half the data rate, um, we're going to expect to use more milliwatts per gigabit per second. So the primary vehicle for assessing the efficiency of a link is this uh, milliwatts per gigabit per second, which if you look at those units can be reduced to picojoules per bit. So it's going to take more picojoules per bit as the channel loss goes up. And you see that we don't have very many examples of links much beyond 40 dB of loss. Beyond that, um, the power dissipation necessary for equalization makes the links impractical. So this increased power dissipation for for higher channel loss favors using photonic technologies. As we'll see, photonic technologies may have loss associated with them, but it tends to be frequency independent, at least for the frequency range of, uh, of high-speed I.O. And so we can, uh, over longer reach, like more than a meter or two, it would become more power efficient to use uh, an optical link. And so that's the purpose of this talk, is to ultimately get into optical link design. So before we talk specifically about optical links, let's look at some of the fundamentals of wireline communication. So this slide shows a very generic block diagram of a high-speed link. So in the middle, we have a channel. So that channel could be uh, an electrical channel. Um, that would, could be a very low-loss channel inside a package. It could be a interposer channel. So maybe we have two chips flip chip down into an interposer. Um, or it could be a trace on a printed circuit board, or it could be a more complex channel involving printed circuit boards, boards uh, you know, pushed into a, a backplane. And that backplane channel is sort of the quintessential longer reach, high-speed electrical link, where maybe it's a meter, a meter and a half long, and presents the sort of uh, attenuation at Nyquist that, uh, that really stresses link designers. The channel could also be an optical link, so it could be uh, a fiber optic cable, it could be some sort of optical interposer or backplane connection, um, but the most typical scenario is, uh, is a fiber optic cable. We see a lot of those deployed in data centers. So let's look at the, at the block diagram. So on the left, the transmitter takes low speed data. Um, by low speed, I mean at the microprocessor's clock speed, so that could be you know, maybe a megahertz, and then multiplexes many data streams together to produce a single high-speed data stream. That's applied to a driver, and so we see at the output of the driver this two-valued signal where one level represents a one, one level represents a zero. That signal propagates down a channel. At the far end of the channel, it doesn't look quite the same as what it looked like when it was transmitted. So uh, maybe it doesn't have the same amplitude, maybe it's smoothed out a bit. The receiver is going to have some sort of analog front end, uh, and then we will likely have some sort of equalizer where we'll try to uh, recover that data. Or if, if there's been some high frequency attenuation in, along the channel, we might try to boost those high frequencies. Or it might use other equalization techniques which involve feeding back uh, previously received bits. Ultimately, that continuous time signal is going to be um, fed to a clock and data recovery unit. And that clock and data recovery unit is going to have a clock signal, it's going to sample that data stream, regenerate it, and then ultimately deserialize it into these lower speed data streams that are suitable for processing in a CPU or a GPU. Because this operation has serialization and deserialization, these links are frequently referred to as SIRDES in the electrical context. So this block diagram is very generic. There's a lot of different aspects to implementation. 
and, and, and variations on it as well. Um, in some cases, uh, you know, the driver is on a is on a is on a different chip, or it might involve different technologies. In the case of a photonic link, um, and so a lot of that is up to the the link designer. Let's talk more about what the data look like when they're transmitted. So there are many ways of encoding information on a signal. These uh, wired links, uh, many of them use very simple modulation. Modulation that's of the form of a pulse amplitude modulated signal or PAM signal. So PAM2 implies that there are two values to the signal. So we can encode one bit by uh, one bit of information per bit period or per unit inter interval. So in this region, the signal is a zero. And so the signal will be output at a level L corresponding to the zero, L zero. We have another zero, up here we have a one. And so at this point, the signal takes on value or level L one, the value corresponding to a one. So on the left, it's a square wave. It's very idealized. Uh, maybe it gets smoothed out a bit. Um, and then uh, on the right shows sort of the aggregation of many unit intervals of data getting smoothed out. So there's some amplitude A, which is the difference between the one level and the zero level. Now, if we want to transmit data at a very high data rate, that unit interval needs to shrink. That can imply a very wide band signal. A way to get around that is uh, called PAM4, where we subdivide the entire range A into four levels. So we can encode two bits per symbol. So when we go from PAM2 to PAM4, we can double the data rate for the same unit interval. Of course, we are shrinking the, the margins on, on the vertical axis. When we want to decode this data, <clears throat> we need to apply the data stream to some sort of decision level. So in the PAM2 case, in the top, we've got this LD decision level. For PAM4, we're going to then have three decision levels. So the margin between the signal and the decision level shrinks. So that can make the, uh, the detection more, more challenging. PAM2 is frequently referred to as non-return to zero uh, or NRZ. Um, so we'll use that terminology and we'll see that terminology a lot. We want to think a little bit about these NRZ signals. Um, and so an interesting tool for this involves decomposing the signal into a summation of shifted and scaled rectangular pulses. So I've written the summation notation here, where x of t is the sum of d sub k times the shifted rect function. So the d sub k's are going to be a 1 when we want to transmit a 1, and they're going to take on a value of minus 1 when we want to transmit a 0. And so you can see that uh, in this example, the first three unit intervals of x of t are shown here, where we have a negative going rect, a positive going rect that's shifted by 1, and then the negative going rect shifted by 2. This is a useful tool because we can... Uh, there's some mathematics that lets us discuss the frequency content of x of t. And also, when we want to consider the, uh, the effect of uh, you know, bandwidth limitation of a channel, we can leverage some linear time invariant system properties. So taking a look at the frequency content, um, it can be shown that if those d sub k's are random, the power spectral density of x of t is given by 1 over the bit period multiplied by the magnitude of the Fourier transform of, of the, the, the constituent pulse, in this case, the rect pulse. So when we have a random signal like, uh, like x of t, we can't talk about its Fourier transform, but we talk about its power spectral density instead. So the the power spectral density of, uh, of this random data looks like the sync function. So on with a linear vertical axis, it's got these set the central peak and then it goes down to zero at multiples of the bit rate. 
And then on a log scale, we see it on the right where that first lobe is about 15 dB down. So we notice that there's these nulls in the power spectral density at the, the data rate. And looking at this, this frequency response plot motivates us to set the bandwidth to be something like this. We might have to you know, uh, have a system that passes most of this central lobe. So we'll see in a lot of wireline design, we're going to say, okay, we've, we've got a wide enough bandwidth if the bandwidth of the system is 50 to 70% of the data rate. Now, one of uh, another tool that we'll use uh, to inspect the signal integrity of a, of a link is to draw an eye diagram of a signal at different points in the link. So to draw an eye diagram, we dice up the signal into sections that are maybe two unit intervals long. That's shown up here where each of these different color coded sections is two UI long. And then we're going to overlay them on top of each other. So we're going to put all these here. It's as if we have a scope that's going to draw it and then be re-triggered and go back and draw it again. And this, this process of overlaying the signal lets us in one uh, small picture see many uh, important aspects of signal integrity. Like we can see jitter, we can see intersymbol interference. Um, so let, let's talk about those in a bit more detail. So we, we look at this and we see that in this idealized eye diagram, no matter what the previous bit has been, the signal at the decision time is either up here or down here. So we would say that the previous bit has no influence on the current bit. We would say, therefore, the signal has no intersymbol interference, no ISI. We also see that it's noiseless as well. There's no random variation in the signal value. The lack of ISI and the lack of noise means that the zero crossings are in exactly the same spot. So we would say we have, we have no jitter. Um, on the bottom, we see a more, a more uh, realistic eye diagram where we see that we have um, a fair amount of intersymbol interference. How do we know that? We know that because if the <clears throat> preceding bit was a one and our current bit's a one, our signal's gonna be up here. If the preceding bit was a zero, uh, we're gonna be somewhere down here when we have a one. So what was happening in the unit interval over here influences what's happening here. And we call that intersymbol interference. Now the eye diagram is great for looking at um, the signal integrity, but it's not that great for predicting the effects of a bandwidth limited channel on the signal integrity. We'll talk a little bit now about how noise can affect bit error rate. So on the left, we have a, uh, an eye uh, or an eye diagram of a signal, and there it's, it's noiseless. The, the, the constant one value is this constant value. Now due to noise, it might look more jagged. So I'm kind of exaggerating here, but we've got, now I've added noise to it for these different transitions. So what we wanna do is we wanna estimate the probability that signal plus noise gives us a bit error. So we would get a bit error if the signal, which would be up here at a one, plus the noise comes down here and crosses the threshold. In terms of probability density functions, um, our, our noiseless signal is shown here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna slice the signal here and look at the PDF of the signal at the decision point. So the noiseless signal V of T has a PDF consisting of two delta functions, one at plus VP, one at minus VP. And then we're going to assume that we're, we're adding to that signal a noise probability density function, or a noise signal N of T that has a, a Gaussian PDF, and that's shown, shown here. So what is the PDF of the noiseless signal plus the noise? When we have when we add two, two independent random variables, we convolve their uh, PDFs. So the overall PDF looks something like this here. And so if the, if the signal plus noise, that's when we transmit a one, uh, extends down across the threshold, we're gonna get an error. So we're gonna get errors in this shaded area. Likewise, if a zero plus noise crosses the threshold, it will be received as a one. And so we'll get um, 
error is here. So to find the error, we need to calculate, to find the error, we need to calculate the area under the curve by integrating that Gaussian distribution out to infinity. And so for this analysis, we've assumed an ideal latch, meaning if the received signal is infinitesimally, uh, an infinitesimally small bit on the far side of the threshold, we get an error, but we can be all the way up to the threshold and not get an error. So the bit error rate can be calculated by evaluating this Q function, where the Q function is the integral of the Gaussian distribution out here. So this is this is uh, x, and we're going to find the area of the curve from x up to infinity, and that's going to give us the error. Now that's a difficult function to evaluate, but of course, you know, MATLAB and other math packages will do that. For um, for x greater than three, we can approximate the Q function with this uh, sort of deterministic function. It doesn't require uh, an integration. What many designers just sort of remember in, their, in, in the back of their mind is that for a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 12, which is a common target, this argument x needs to be greater than seven. So what does that mean? It means that the mean here needs to be seven sigma from the, from the decision threshold. Or the peak signal value needs to be seven times the RMS noise. If we take, want to take into account a practical latch. So for a practical latch, we're going to assume that there's some region in the middle around the decision threshold where if the signal falls, we're going to get an error. So now the, the area under the curve that gives an error gets moved out from the decision threshold by this V min value out to here. So we can simply reevaluate the Q function where our argument is it's not VP. VP was the distance from the mean to the threshold. Instead it's going to be the distance from the peak value to the um, to the sort of danger zone for the latch. So the numerator here is this distance here. How do we incorporate ISI? The diagrams we looked at before had no ISI. In reality, we're going to have ISI. So let's first talk about what the exact analysis would look like. So the exact analysis is going to involve finding the PDF at the decision point by, again, slicing the signal vertically here and kind of flipping that on its side and drawing the PDF. I've kind of... Uh, approximated here, assuming that we have kind of one level here, um, we have one level here, one level here. So we have sort of three levels for ones, three levels for zeros, giving a, a PDF looking something like that. So the exact analysis would involve putting a scaled Gaussian at each of those points, at each of those those deltas. But that's not, that's not that um, easy to do. We're going to have to evaluate many functions. So instead what we can do is we can just put the Gaussian noise distribution at the closest uh, uh, delta function to the decision threshold. And so that's shown down here, where we calculate the area under the curve uh, in this area shown here. So we evaluate the Q function, where the numerator is the vertical eye opening, which is that sort of minimum opening in the middle, so this distance here, divided by the standard deviation of noise. Okay, we said earlier that the uh, the uh, eye diagram was good for seeing the effects of signal integrity, but it's not that great for seeing the um, for predicting its effect. So, uh, a really important tool in wireline design is the pulse response. So, the pulse response, the definition of the pulse response is here. So, we take a unit input pulse R of t. It lasts one TB. We apply it to our system. The response of the system to this input R of t is the unit pulse response, denoted here as HUI. I like to use H as the, uh, the variable uh, in part because it kind of conjures up this notion of an impulse response. 
We can't generate impulses in practical terms. So this is sort of like an impulse response, but the input is instead um, uh, this unit rectangular pulse. We can find the resulting output to uh, random data by leveraging LTI system properties. So if our input signal is this linear combination of uh, unit pulses, our output y of t is the same linear combination of unit pulse responses shown here. So th there's some notation we should discuss. So we look at this uh, unit pulse response. We sample it at the peak. We call the peak the main cursor. We denote it as h0. We then sample it uh, every bit period, every ui. And we call those other terms the isi terms. The terms for the subscripts greater than one are called the post cursor ISI, and the terms where the subscript is less than zero form the precursor ISI. So you can see uh, in the middle here how this particular X of T results in a particular Y of T, where I've just shifted pulse responses. They're upside down because the first few bits are negative, then there's one that's positive, and then the rest are, are negative. And then this gray curve is my y of t. So notice at this point here, I compute y2 by taking an h0 and subtracting from it the ISI terms from the following and preceding bits. So that, let's say that's the worst case point to find how open the eye is there. I take the main cursor and I subtract from it the absolute value of all the ISI terms. And then, you know, I multiply that quantity by two to get the vertical eye opening in a peak to peak uh, context. So the pulse response is a great way, a great tool for characterizing a system in a way that's meaningful for predicting the inner symbol interference and the vertical eye opening. <laughs> So this slide shows a, a couple of different links. Um, on the right here, we've got a die-to-die -die link where there's an interconnect on a, uh, inside an advanced package. And then the bottom, we've got a longer uh, link where the, the channel goes through a PCB, through a backplane, and through another PCB. Um, on the, the top, we have some actual results where we have a channel loss spectrum. We have a eye diagram, which is fully closed. Um, and then we have the pulse response before the channel and then after the channel. So the pulse response before the channel would be uh, imperfect due to maybe packaging parasitics. And then the pulse response after the channel, it's spread out considerably um, due to the bandwidth limitations. So in electrical link design, we just have to deal with that. And we have to look at that pulse response and figure out how can we equalize it so as to get rid of the ISI. Um, in an optical link, we may just try to design it so we don't introduce ISI. But certainly seeing the amount of ISI that can occur over a backplane channel motivates the use of optics um, because the optical fiber won't introduce ISI like that. Or if it does, it'll introduce it over you know, hundreds of meters, not a single meter. So the, the power dissipation associated with with equalizing a closed eye motivates a transition to optics. So in the next video, I'll talk about optical communication fundamentals, including concepts such as link budget and some of the noise analysis that we're going to have to, to discuss. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, stay tuned for another video.